Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for hanging in. I know it's late in the day. Uh, really appreciate seeing you out here. I'm Jeremy. I'm from Dagger. Anybody know Dagger already? A couple, couple people know Dagger. So you could think of us as a way to, uh, we're an open source project, but we're also a company. And what you use Dagger for is you can write in real code that you're already maybe writing your apps in, like Python or Golang or TypeScript, whatever. And then we have an API that allows you to describe things that you want to have happen in a pipeline. So often like a CI CD pipeline might be a good application, data pipelines, things like that. But a lot of people use us for CI CD. And so you can think of us as CI that's code and it runs the same everywhere because it's all in container. So that's kind of like the setting, but I'll go into a lot more and I think you'll get reinforced. And by the time you get out of here, you'll be like, oh yeah, I know what Dagger is. But um, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm using some uh, non-free uh, tech in, in to make my presentation. Um, and I'll call out anything else that's not open source along the way. So first of all, the talk was local equal to CI. Why would I even want to do that? Is that important? We have CI servers. We've got Jenkins, people using GitHub Actions, you know, whatever you're using out there in the world. Why would you want to make local equal to CI? And I also, you know, kind of the subtitle of the talk was, yes, it's going to be fun, but also so we can get more community contributions. So the idea is it's all about access, getting more people able to contribute to our, pro our project. And, you know, so creating an on-ramp, if you will. It can be really intimidating to get started a lot of times. And it's helpful if there's ways that you can get an environment going quickly without having to know everything or be super experienced at the project. And these are some quotes up here that you can take a peek at just from some different sources, talking about how documentation or maybe even better automation that gives you environments to get started in or gives you a way to try things yourself can really help with getting more contributors on your project. And these contributors could be people from outside, but they could even just be, you know, it might be a company and you may have hired new folks and you have to onboard them, or it's a new code base that you're working on, et cetera. So it can be really hard to get ramped up. And we notice there's also a lot of problems, between, you know, communication problems, classic DevOps problems between different teams. And as has been mentioned a lot uh, so far, it's also important to get these non-code contributions in. So people that are contributing to docs, people that are doing testing, people that are um, doing design and user experience, they want to be able to try the software in its current state as well and provide feedback and provide assets to build that up, right? And as we said, and has been said before, it's a lot of fun to do this. And I hope you come away thinking it would be fun to try this too. So why is it hard to make your local environment the same as the CI environment. So it's not just whether you have access to the source code and can go and say, I'm going to compile this myself and set up everything myself. This is funny. I went to look for one of these, you know, how to run things diagrams. And <laughs> the first thing that came up for whatever reason in my search was uh, the Channel 6 News in Tulsa, Oklahoma today. Apparently, they have an article up about CI CD pipelines. I was like, wow. That's amazing. It's from 2020, but still, I was amazed to see it. When I dug in a little more, they had, you know, here's a little bit better uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. There's a lot going on, and when you're trying to take just some code and say, like, oh, yeah, I know how to run that. I know how to run tests on that. I know how to do all the things. It's not that easy, especially when you're just getting used to a project. And people are using all sorts of tech to do things. So, again, as a new contributor, you're literally coming into someone else's factory with all these different production lines set up and things are hooked up in ways that you may not be familiar with. So let's walk through one of these typical software factories and kind of see how things develop in real time. So it starts out super easy and idyllic, right? So day one, maybe someone's like, well, we're just gonna use GitHub Actions. We've got a pretty simple code base. You know, we just do a build and a test, and it's so easy. It's great. Everyone understands it. And then pretty soon, one team starts saying, well, wait a second. We need to maintain 
the CI platform. So we need to get very specific about what versions we're using, which tools we're using, um, you know, where we're getting them from. Are we going to use these? Uh, this is like GitHub Actions, for example. We're going to use these GitHub Actions. Are we going to run shell scripts? Or what are we going to do? And then developers at this point may be off trying to make their own local environments that get them pretty close so that by the time they push their code, it actually works in CI. And so people are on their laptop, I'm on a Mac, so I might be using Brew, or maybe you're on a Linux laptop and you're using your package manager of choice, and then you're using other tools, like maybe your make file, just file, task file, who knows, and your own scripts or whatever, right? And you're trying to make a local environment so that when you push, it isn't crazy, it doesn't break. But it turns out over time, this problem gets even harder. So this is, uh, you know, maybe day after a year has gone by or something. And this is a real file I got from one of our users and it's been anonymized. But, and this is a GitLab CI file. YAML, thousand plus lines. And it's like, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. If you come into a project and you see that, you're not going to know how to, you know, kind of get going or certainly not know how to make that a local environment that replicates that. So, um, and for a lot of folks who are on Jenkins, maybe Groovy is in your life, right? And maybe you love it, but a lot of people tell me they're, they're trying to get off it because not enough people on the team understand it. So this simple, idyllic factory starts turning into a tire fire. And uh, what we end up seeing as kind of a uh, symptom of this is developers or platform engineers, DevOps people, whoever, they just, they'll make a change and they push it and they're like, I hope it works. Because at this point, the complexity has gotten to so high, and, and what you've got on your laptop is certainly not the same as what is in the CI server, that you just, that's what else can you do? You push, you pray, and I'm a seasoned contributor to this project, and I'm like, I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, it didn't work. And I'm really bummed out. But if I'm like a contributor off the street, I'm like, dude, this is not something I'm really up to. I might be out of here, right? This is not, I'm, it's not an easy on-ramp. So this factory that we have set up, the way we're setting up these factories, it needs to be retooled. Or, I mean, luckily we're in software, we're not in the hardware factory, so we can actually like change the software. And we have the technology building blocks to do a lot of this stuff. So as I mentioned before, uh, in the Dagger approach, we like to use an actual programming language. We think it's a lot better than using YAML in a lot of cases because you get all the advantages that we get from programming languages. You can do all the you know, loops and all the other things. You can write functions, you can have libraries, all the abstraction that we're used to with code. And you're probably already using a programming language in your project right now. And today with all the different you know, AI co-pilots or IDEs and things like that, with, uh, you can, a lot of people can drive these things that maybe weren't up to writing code before with all the suggestions and things that you get. It's a lot easier for people to approach that. Additionally, containers. Containers have been around for over a decade. Well, way more than that, but you know, really easy to access with Docker and Kubernetes and things for over a decade. And they provide a lot of advantages. A lot of isolation, so you can have a container that doesn't affect anything else on your system. You can get caching because containers get built up in these layers and you can save those layers, right? And repeat them, replay them. And then we have existing CI servers. I already mentioned others like uh, Jenkins and GitHub Actions, CircleCI, GitLab CI. There's tons of them out there, you know, Drone and Woodpecker and you know, lots, of, lots of free and open source ones as well. Um, so those exist and those are great and they're hooked up to Git servers that we're already using. So, and additionally, dev machines, stronger than ever, whether you have a really beefy Linux laptop or you get a MacBook like mine here, really, really strong dev machines. We should be putting those to use. So this is where Dagger comes in. Remember I was saying uh, for folks that just walked in, Dagger is an open source project uh, we're under the Apache 2 license, and please come hang out and contribute. We'd love to see you over there. Uh, I'll, get, I'll walk you through a little bit of the Dagger and how Dagger is put together, just so you're oriented, because we're going to use that in our demo examples as we go a little bit deeper in. Um, so here's the Dagger project as it is today. Um, as you can see, it's a public GitHub repo, almost 11,000 stars. We're getting there. And um, Apache 2.0. So if you look at the center of it, kind of the core, we've got this Dagger engine, which today we ship as a container uh, that goes along with some SDKs. So those SDKs are what you would write your Dagger code in. 
And like I said, they're in real programming languages. So you write in Go or TypeScript or Python. And there's community SDKs out there for Java. Uh, a new PHP one just hit. People are working on you know, .NET. They're working on, uh, el there's an Elixir SDK. There's a bunch of SDKs people are working on as well. So they can write whatever language. And all these SDKs are interoperable. So if you write something in your programming language, your favorite programming language, it just works on all the others. And I'll show you more about that. But this core API is cool because remember, we're building these pipelines. So we want to have certain sorts of artifacts we can work with. And so we want to be able to create new containers. You know, I want to pull in a Python container because, uh, you know, on my laptop, I don't have Python, but I want to pull in a Python environment, do some stuff in it, take the results of that, maybe put that in a different container that I'm going to ship. Or maybe I'm going to just take the files out of that and I'm going to put those somewhere else. Or I want to work with things from Git, or I want to connect to a socket, a Unix socket, or whatever I might want to do. That's what the core API is all about. And this is an example of some TypeScript code that shows us interacting uh, with that. So you write in Dagger, you write functions. Functions are everybody understands. You have the name of a function. It's got some parameters, and it's got something goes in, something goes out. So in this case, I've got a build function. The function takes in a directory, and it emits a container. So for folks that are familiar, anyone familiar with writing Docker files, things like that, right? So it's probably going to look sort of similar. You can imagine like how you build up a Docker file and you start with often, like especially in that second bit here, starting from a particular container image like this Nginx image, I'm going to then add a directory to it and then expose a port on it. And then that's what gets returned. But if you look in there on the build, the line that says build, that's actually the result uh, from up there. That variable build up there gets, uh, we're running some other function that executes npm run build and then and takes out of there just the dist directory and then sticks that in new. So it's like a multi, this is like a multi-stage build you'd see in a Docker file. And kind of a nice, I don't know if it's nice, but an illustration of that process on the right side. So you see that final container underlined in yellow is kind of that the heavy yellow outlined container in the bottom. You can also, so that's running, that's using an SDK. Who's using different languages? Like if I were to say out of the top three, I mentioned the TypeScript, the Python, and the Golang, who's Python in here? Got some Python a little bit. How about TypeScript or JavaScript? Okay, and how about Golang? Okay, so just for you, for you other folks, I'll just, uh, I took that, that first slide that I had, uh, the TypeScript one. Here's like an example of that. Um, this, is, this would be an example of that. Let's uh, unskip these two just for fun. So here's the same thing in Python. And you see it looks, it's Python. So, but we're using the same API. So here I called something called buildm, which is another function in this file somewhere, imagine. And then I did the same thing. I executed some stuff. I took out a directory. And then I fed that into a container from Nginx. Same sort of thing in Python. Uses snake case, which is Python. Uh, very typical. And then if you're a gopher and you love Golang, you know, things look like they do in lots of uh, Pascal case. Uh, and... Uh, pointers and things like that, that, that we get when in Golang, but same API happening behind the hood, right? Okay, cool. So the other thing you could do is you can call these same API calls actually from the CLI as well. And this is actually how you invoke, how you kind of have the entry point into your pipeline. So you saw, we had this thing called build, this function called build. Then I can call it from the command line with dagger call build. And then I can feed in that source parameter that we have here, right in on the command line here with this source parameter. That will give me a container back. And then that container has a bunch of different functions I can run on it. Inherently, a container type can be published. It can be exported as a tarball. It can have a directory pulled out of it. It can be the basis of another container. So um, in this case, I'm showing taking that and publishing it to ttl.sh, which is a fun kind of ephemeral pack, uh, registry for containers. 
or on the, on the side of the right here, you've got uh, a terminal that's being spun up. So this allows you to jump into the container and look around and debug stuff. So that's all stuff in the API. Cool. And then say I've written this set of functions and I want to share them with other people. Well, you would use the Daggerverse. So the Daggerverse is, I'll kind of show you what that looks like over here. The Daggerverse is a place where we've got in an index, essentially, of a ton of different modules that people have written in all these different languages. And like I say, all you have to do is install one of them and you can use it anywhere. So like here's an example we'll show a little later of this DocuSaurus module. Somebody wrote, when you want to install it, you just run dagger install, and then you have the module locally, and then you can do any of the things that the any of the things the module can do. So, um, and we'll dig into this one, like I said, in a little bit. Everything that's in the Daggerverse is got an open source license on it. You can check that out. And this one's an MIT licensed one, for example. And you can view the source code because everything is hosted on public Git servers. It could be on GitLab, could be on GitHub, could be on a public Git server, you know, something that's publicly accessible on the internet. But it could be something you host as well. So that's what the Daggerverse is all about, tons and tons of stuff. And the Daggerverse, I'll call out, the Daggerverse itself, we maintain it and the source code is not open. But as I said, all the modules that are in there are, they're just indexed. We don't store them. They're stored in whoever's Git server. And um, all the licenses are called out explicitly. So here's like the use case of, I want to use a module somebody else wrote. So here I'm pulling in this module called my module and I ran dagger install of, of that's my GitHub uh, account. So I ran my module, uh, install my module there at a certain version. And then that gives me access to all the functions that are in there. And this one happened to have a build and a lint and a release function. And I wanted to use them. So I installed it and then I was able to do dagger call of my test function and inside of it, you see it's using build that came from that other module. So this is, I'm able to like get new capabilities just by installing modules. And I can then take what I've gotten out of there, which is a container, this one returns a container. And then as I showed you before on the command line, I can do all kinds of stuff. I can do that container, I could publish it, I could get run it and get the standard out, the, or I could jump it to a terminal inside it, like a dev environment or a debug environment and kind of showed you some of that before. And here's another example where you might start with some like a base container, you call some function that gives you a container out, and then maybe you execute with the API, adding, this is an Alpine type container, and you add a few more packages, and then you publish it, right? Again, so you can really experiment, get a loop where you're experimenting between code and the CLI, and you might say, oh cool, hey, what if I added one more package, and then I put that in the registry, does that make my container work the way I want? Oh awesome, now I'm gonna go put, memorialize that in some actual code. So it gives you a lot of ways to play back and forth with these environments. And then, so to kind of net it out for somebody that wants an overview, we have this test function I wrote, I'm able to, within it, I'm able to call my modules build function because I installed it, and it comes from there. And then when I ran dagger call test on the command line, I'm able to use these other functions from the core API, like publish, standard out, or terminal. And you could think of it as me doing dagger install extends the core API by adding on new functionality. Cool. So what was the point of all of that? Well, now I've, we've built up a system here it's all running containers. It's all sandboxed. All I need on my laptop is Dagger and the ability to run containers. So it could be, you could use Docker, you could use NerdCTL and Lima, you could use Podman, you could use any, whatever container runtime you want to use. Uh, and now, finally, the point of the kind of part, part of the point of the talk was to talk about how I could run things locally the same as in CI. So now I can call that function, like that build function, from the CLI on my laptop, dagger call build. But now I want to run this from Jenkins. I can also just run dagger call build. Or on GitHub Actions, it's called dagger call build or GitLab CI or anywhere. And so it means that now I've got portability. I'm not really locked in to using the YAML format and all of the YAML, uh, you know, kind of the, of the, all the GitHub Actions that are coming there. But I could 
write this in Dagger and have some portability across. And also, I have the benefit of being able to run this locally, which is huge, because now, as a new person coming to the project who doesn't know anything about the setup, can't hope to replicate a giant YAML file full of stuff, I could come into a project, Git clone it, and run Dagger call build, and I could have that environment the same as everyone else does, and know that it'll be have some fidelity that goes along with what's in, in CI. And then I'll just mention this super briefly because this is um, there's Dagger Cloud for visualizing your stuff, and this is a commercial part of our platform as well, and you're more than welcome to use it or not. It's got a free tier, right? So it just allows you to dig in and uh, look at your services, pull logs, you know, look at kind of like really debug stuff and collaborate on stuff. But I won't, I won't highlight that because it's not the point of this talk or this conference, really. So again, that's proprietary, but there's free access. Okay, so now let's actually show some demos of some of this stuff in action. And I chose just a few examples. Um, I'm hoping for many more. I'm hoping some of your projects could be examples in the future. It'd be super fun to do together. Um, I picked the Spokane uh, Tech Group, Spokane, Washington. I've stumbled across them because someone in the Dagger community um, is part of that community as well, and he wrote some stuff uh, internally with Dagger. And so let's dive into that one first. All right, so I think I have this one right here. So I did this as a demo recorded because I came in yesterday and the Wi-Fi was uh, not super reliable, but we can I can get into it and show you tons of code and whatever as is necessary or interesting. Uh, but I just recorded that this this morning. So if I look at Spokane Tech, there's this really cool local tech hub. They've got all these different user groups for Rust, Python, different languages. They help people find jobs and get skills, mentorship. So it seems like a really good organization. And they have all their different tech groups here and their events on their page. And this is the Spokane Python user group. And again, they're very active. They have meetups and all kinds of stuff going on. So I want to go visit Spokane, Washington, just to check out these, the, these folks. And they have a nice Discord server, too. So then uh, I went and I cloned down their GitHub repo. And I ran Dagger functions. So like now I'm like in their repo. And all I had to do was run Dagger functions, and I know that, hey, here's a bunch of things that are available to me in that environment. I'm going to pull this out and put it back in, just in case the freezing on my laptop is only related to that. And while I reboot that, um, and then hopefully reshow it, questions so far. Anything that like seems very confusing, or is it making some sense? Exactly. Yeah. So, a great question. So, the question was: all the plugins or the uh, the modules that you saw, you don't need to worry about writing them in every language yourself. It gets taken care of. And that's exactly right. So you write it in whatever your language of choice is, and then Dagger will take that and code gen that, because under the hood, like way under the hood, everything uses this common like GraphQL API layer. And so we're able to then do code gen across languages and produce code bindings for any other language. Go for it. see um could you okay s restate that once more for me yeah mm -hmm. yep oh got it right got it yeah so the question is like do you need to have the runtime locally for if you're going to use a TypeScript module and 
do you need to have TypeScript? If you're going to use a Golang module, do you need to have Golang installed? If you're going to use Python, do you need to have Python installed? No, you don't need anything installed. So all you need to install is Dagger CLI, and it will take, a, a, take care of creating, pulling a runtime container image that will create that Python or the TypeScript or the Golang environment to then run that module inside of. So it kind of takes care of all that. So yeah, you could literally walk in with just the ability to run containers and, uh, and the Dagger CLI, and you can just start engaging with, with the project or code like that. Great question. All right. So. Yeah, please do. Right. So, um, so for Dagger, the Dagger engine does run as a privileged container, but that's the only one. So everything else is within that. So if there's any other, if it spins up any other containers, et cetera, that's all kind of within that engine. So what people will do is, um, and so, you know, a lot of times if you give, if you have, if you have root access on your machine, if you're running stuff on your machine, um, it's essentially, you know, um, it does, uh, you can of course run anything, right? But you can also, you can delete files and all sorts of other things. The difference with Dagger is it is a container that's privileged, which just gives it the ability to create other containers, but it doesn't allow it to access your host. So anything that comes in from your host or goes out to your host, you have to explicitly allow. And that way we keep that sandbox so that even though it is privileged, it's, it's actually, we try and we're really careful about keeping things safe so that it can't, so something that, you know, went crazy someone that wrote something attempting to be malicious it's just not possible to to read and write directly from the host wow that's really unusual um so for whatever reason my normal login password doesn't work either so maybe somebody was like somebody uh yeah, I shouldn't have connected to the Wi-Fi. <laughs> this is an interesting question. Um, what's that? That's I was, That's what I thought. It's certainly possible, but I, I did try that. Let's try one more time. Wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, so let me see. How could I do that? Let's try to show you all a quick demo of this. give it one more shot. Um, additionally, I was wondering how, what are people using for CI today? What kind of, are people involved in that process or is it something that somebody else takes care of that? I don't need to worry about that. Do you have, do you have actions? Okay. You write groovy? Okay. No, no, uh, that's, I'm really interested in, uh, uh, how, why, unfortunately? Ah, right. Anytime you want to do something more, more, 
sudden it's not done. Totally. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, so uh, for folks that aren't familiar with Jenkins, you have a scripting language av available that is supposed to be accessible f and familiar feeling for Java programmers, but yet easy to get into. And um, but you know, it seems like there's some points where you have to dive into the the real hardcore Java stuff to make. Yeah. Yeah, it's just simple stuff. <laughs> Mm. That sounds frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm guessing that I don't know what's going on with my computer. Something that's never happened to me before. But um, what I would encourage all of you to do is, if you, what you saw is at all interesting, I think we got to see a. We didn't really get to see much of the Spokane Tech one. Um, but if you're at all interested in seeing how this goes down, definitely jump on Dagger.io, uh, and you can see our Discord there. I'm in the Discord all the time. Hit me up. Um, if I can get this going at some point. Um, during the show, I'm happy to uh, work with you on anything that you might want to check out. And I'd love to, uh, if folks have open source repos and that they'd like to try a little bit of Dagger on, super into that right now. So we've got a few of us on the team that are helping to Daggerize open source repos. Uh, so I'd love to pair with you because it's great for us because we learn a ton by doing that. And, um, and then hopefully it's good for you too because then you have a system where your contributors and your and the folks on your team can do things in a way that's more consistent and easier to get more folks onboarded. So, be, I'm not going to waste any more time because this thing doesn't want to doesn't want to uh, let me in. Uh, but I'll let you all go. But again, follow up with me if you want stickers. I've got some up here. I've got some business cards if you like really old school tech. I've got some business cards. And again, I'm happy to pair with anybody that wants to. Uh, build something in Dagger or just talk more about it. Thanks again. I'll keep asking. Yeah, I'll take any questions. So, um, questions what's the worst one I've seen? So, there's yeah, it's funny because I, it's sort of related to uh, so and so some of the some of the other examples I was going to show you, which I don't think they're the worst, but you know some of the other ones for folks that came in um, that didn't see that part, I was going to show you all. In addition to the Spokane Tech folks, uh, the Go Releaser project. Some folks may be familiar with that. Uh, it's used by tons of people who are releasing Go projects. 
Um, we're looking at, you know, daggerizing that to help with contributions. So that's actually a pretty nice project that was GitHub Actions based, but we're looking at moving some of that into Dagger. Um, the Prometheus uh, project has like a Golang CLI that goes along with Prometheus, you know, for Kubernetes monitoring and metrics and all that sort of stuff. Um, we're working with them on something there. And then um, starting to go the Dagger repo. Ours was pretty bad in a lot of ways. Uh, before we had tons of like make files and like you would to do anything, it would be like, you come in the project and you'd run hack, make, we had a hack directory, you know, so you had like hack, make, whatever, and then you'd try and, you know, build a, pro build a dev environment that way. So now we've dog fooded ourselves to where we're a lot more like just called dagger, dagger dev and dagger call dev or something and get a dev environment. So, you know, hopefully we can walk the walk that we're talking right in our own CI, which is tough. It's not easy. I'd say, um, one that. Um, one that I really, uh, ran into recently, it was like in this FinTech space, um, open source in the, in kind of the FinTech space. And it was this giant, massive, sprawling Java project. Um, it's open source, but it's Java and it's complicated. And I think, and there's different devs, like one had the backend stuff kind of on lockdown, several different services, and another dev focused more on the middleware and the front end. And they had, you could look at like, it was like strata of uh, where people tried to make easier developer environments for local. And so you saw, oh, there's a Docker Compose that, oh, but it's kind of been left and it's kind of crufty. It's not really working anymore. And then like, oh, here's like a, another attempt done in, you know, yet in, in, in all in shell scripts, you know? And if you just run these shell scripts in order, um, then, you know, and it, it ends up being Maven build, Maven build, you know, and then if you run these in the right order, you can get, get something or here it was like actual like Docker run commands. So first you build all these containers with Docker files. And so like all these different kind of attempts to create something like that. So I think they were doing really well in terms of the scale of the project, but not, it's not easy to get on board in a project like that. It's certainly not. I, 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 I tried to daggerize part of it. And it was like super challenging to uh, to understand what was happening in the first place. And I just want to make sure GitLab itself that is oh like internally like a, or other. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. No, it can be, it can be really challenging to try and, uh, it's kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine or like nesting dolls. It's just like trying to get it to all work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nectos act. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, um, kind of at the beginning, when things are good and they're green and things are early, probably just about anything feels fine. And it probably is. And then I think that the challenge, it's kind of like you're the frog in the pot, you know, and like over time, like you, you add a little more, you add a little more, things diverge a little more, a little more. And then pretty soon you find yourself in a place where you're like, oh, wait, things have gotten really complicated. And they're really different for like the, what devel devs are doing or contributors are trying to do compared to what we do in our CI. 
And then you're like, okay, where am I at? What do I do? And so a lot of people have tried. The reason why ACT came out, I think, is that people said, well, I've got all these GitHub Actions. I want to run the same thing locally. And uh, and then what I've heard, and I, I don't have enough experience to, to speak on it. I've just heard from some people saying, yeah, it, it, it does do a lot but it doesn't do it all and it doesn't do it exactly the same. And so people end up getting in that boat where they're like, it's like almost the same, but then there might be something that isn't exactly the same and that's the thing that bites them. Uh, I don't know though. I'm, I don't, and I, I could see that being a problem in that um, if you're not actually creating the exact same like runtime environments, but you're relying on like, I'm running it on my laptop versus you know running it on a GitHub Actions Ubuntu runner with certain giant kitchen sink full of software loaded, like that's probably going to be a different experience. Um, but yeah, so I, but I feel their pain and I would love, <laughs> you know, if we can uh, work together or help uh, with any of that, it'd be, I'd be, I'll be all for it. Yeah. Any other horror stories that people have for, uh, I know these, these people, I know this guy or in the right here definitely experienced some horror stories. The CI. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you ever have the plug in, you know, the like dependency hell situations or? Uh... Yeah. Right. I think it's just, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone to be unnamed has a neighbor to be unnamed who works on the CrowdStrike build systems was just mentioned. And I can only imagine like how the complexity of stuff can lead to mistakes or that could, that could be devastating. Yeah. <laughs> he stopped watching the news. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that stuff is super stress inducing. So yeah, to the extent that you can keep your life simple and keep things, keep things the same, and have like a have everything be actually in like in code and automated, so that it actually runs the same every time, versus in a run book that the human has to perform the same every time. Um, which is putting a lot on us humans because we're not that good at doing the same thing exactly the same every time. Um, so again, I, one of the reasons why you know, for us, any of us who've suffered through that uh, a little bit on the operation side, uh, <laughs> it's, it's coming from a, from a place of empathy and trying to make it better. Um, well, I really appreciate everybody hanging in there and asking amazing questions and sharing your stories and I will let you go. And again, track me down uh, online or in person if you want to hack on anything and 